Well, God bless you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. It is indeed a joy to be here with you. And as we get a brand new year started, Tabernacle and Friends here in our pastoral Bible study uh, time on Tuesday evenings, we thank God and we praise God. We have so much in store for us this year, God willing. Wow. Remember that phrase from uh, the book of James, God willing, we will do this or will we, we will do that on the morrow if it be the Lord's will. If 2021 taught me anything, it has helped me again reaffirm that all that we do, we can plan. Yes, we can. We can write it down. We can put it on paper. But if it be the Lord's will, we'll get to it. All right. Uh, for instance, uh, this year I wanted to start the year off doing live Bible study sessions. But because of personal matters in my own home and my caregiving of overseer in this particular time of our life, I thought it best that I can make sure that I get a chance to do the Bible study. So this is pre-recorded once again as we get started here in 2022. And with that said, I want you to pray for me, pray for uh, my wife, Jessica. You know, as overseers, we get ready to try and lead our congregation again in some very perilous times. We are praying for you, the Tabernacle family, and all of Christianin, that the Lord will strengthen you this year, that your heart's desires, your dreams, your goals, your families, um, that you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we learn to get more victories, that we stop being so victimous in our thinking, in our disposition. And towards the end of 2021, I saw and witnessed so many saints who we perceived to be strong and fervent and anchored in the Lord. We saw so many backslidings. We saw so many falling away. Uh, it's as if the mind of the people were changing gradually. They were drifting. Remember, we talked about that a little bit in 2021. And if you're listening to me, and if that's been you or if you know a member of our congregation who's in that type of mindset where it just seems like they're just losing the joy of their salvation, church and Jesus Christ, fellowship and does not excite them. You don't see the same glimmer in their eyes that you used to see when we talked about church and the body of Christ and being together. And I want you to help me deal with the ministry of reconciliation, deal with the ministry of encouragement, because this is no time to be fainting. This is no time <laughs> to be stopping. This is no time to be having our hands to the plow of God's wisdom, God's grace, God's assignment, God's anointing in our lives, and us looking back, trying to figure out is following this Jesus thing the best thing I can do? Or can I just go on and do it my way? <laughs> a few nights uh, last week, uh, baby boy and I, Joseph, were talking. And I reminded him of one of my favorite uh, scenes in cinema. And that comes from the, the movie uh, Kingdom of God, where the arrows are about to overtake Jerusalem. And there's a Catholic priest in. They're outnumbered. And it seems like that... Uh, the Arabs are going to ultimately have the victory in taking back Jerusalem after many years from Christians. And this Catholic priest says, why don't we just convert to Islam and then repent later? Uh, let me say real quick for those who are watching Facebook and monitoring this for hate speech. I am not talking bad about Muslims and Islam. I'm just trying to identify those of us who say we are Christians and say, Either we believe what we believe and we're going to stay with it no matter what. Every day won't be easy. Every, every, every wind won't be calm. Do you hear what I'm saying? There will be rain. There will be heartaches in 2022. There will be betrayals. I've said all these things prior to this moment with you. I just want us to get this year started in knowing that we have got to live and mold our lives in the context of knowing God and having our ears tuned in prayer, having our hearts massaged so that the Holy Spirit doesn't have such a hard and difficult time getting us to submit to the will of God. 
And I want you to join me, Tabernacle, this year. And, and let us not try to grieve the Holy Spirit of God so much by our words, by our behaviors, by our actions, by the way we walk and the way we treat people, etc. So I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God would just help you to be all that you can be. Be the best version of yourself that you can. And then finally, thank you so much for humbling your heart as we try to get back to in-person worship services pretty soon here. We're talking with our medical team and others, figuring out ways how we can have in-person, safe, safe in-person worship service. Now, I admit to you, there's no way for us to be able to guarantee that when we come back to in-person worship experiences, that people won't be exposed one way or another, those who are vaccinated, those who are unvaccinated. But we just want to do our due diligence to help people understand what coming together in an in-person worship experience means in the 21st century. All of us have to take a greater responsibility to protect ourselves and the people that we love, even the stranger and our guests, our visitors, who we hope to be able to share ministry in-person services with in this year of 2022. So we'll get those PSAs out as soon as possible so you will know exactly what we plan to do as far as in-person worship services in the year of 2022. So I, I, I'll probably say some more things, but I just wanted to get those things off my heart. We're going to be in Zechariah chapter 4, finishing up some things in chapter 4 tonight, maybe next week as well. And then we'll get to chapter 5, probably around the third week of this year. That'll be January 18th, God willing, God willing. But for right now, open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 4 and bow your heads as we have a time of prayer, asking God, to smile on this matter that we bring before him. Pray with me. Eternal God, thank you for being the compass and the governor and the superintendent of all of our life happenings. We praise you as we live now in this first week of a brand new year. Thank you for your mercy and grace who we always, we always depend so heavily upon. Thank you for your long suffering and forbearance of us who we are as mere humans and i pray tonight lord that you would bless these these teaching sessions that they will be fruitful and that we gain from them principles and and lessons and precepts so that we may live thereby so we invite thee tonight be with us calm our minds from the activities of this busy day and of this first week of the year and give us wisdom as we proceed all glory shall be thine. We declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Isaiah is right. Flowers fade, grass withers, but the word of our God endure forever. So in the book of Zechariah, this uh, next to the last minor prophet of the Bible, we've studied uh, uh, 10 prior to him, and now this is the 11th, and we're just moving right along. And if this is your first evening, I want to affirm that you can go to our Tabernacle Bible Study Facebook page and there you can download all of the study questions that are associated with the book of Zechariah. I ask that you would use those in your personal time of study of the book. And if you come across a word or a question or a personality, a character in the Bible, a city, a place in the Bible that you just can't seem to get uh, answers to from your own study materials, feel free to drop us a line at pastor underscore Manaway at AO, I, I'm sorry, that's my wife, at yahoo.com. <laughs> Let me try that again. That's pastor, P A E S T O R underscore Manaway. M-A-N-A-W-A-Y at yahoo.com. And if you can't reach me there, try the same, the same line, pastor underscore manaway at gmail.com. All right? And we'll try to get you the answers that you need. So in the book of Zechariah, the book of Zechariah is really answering and giving information and giving clarity to eight specific visions that God gives the prophet Zechariah. 
that's how that's a simple way to look at the book of Zechariah for those who are with us uh, for the first time tonight in this study those who have not been back in a while so eight visions that Zechariah uh, is getting from God getting from the angel of God the representative of God and then he's saying I don't know and then these uh, angels or even the Lord himself is providing the answers that Zechariah needs in order to be able to help us understand the teaching. I've discovered over our break that there are about two different versions or two different ways of looking at the eight visions of Zechariah. And I'll try to be as quick as I can in getting these to you so that we can move on to the discussion, which will begin basically in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7. But first, let's look at these two different versions of how people explain the eight visions of Zechariah. First of all, uh, some define or give space to the first vision as myrtle trees. And this is found in verse 1, verse 7 through 17. And there is a footnote that goes along with myrtle trees that says, peace among the nations on earth the myrtle trees peace among the nations on earth again Zechariah chapter 1 verse 7 through verse 17 then the second vision the vision of four horns this footnote is the judgment of nations for their evil the judgment of nations for their evil this uh, vision is found in chapter 1, verse 8 through verse 21. That's chapter 1, verse 8 through 21. Then the third vision is titled, The Measuring Line. And the footnote is, The Habitation of Jerusalem. This is found in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The fourth vision is called or titled in this particular version, Joshua, just one word, and it's a person, Joshua. The footnote is the restoration of the priestly line. This is found in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And then the fifth vision in this particular version is labeled Zerubbabel. The footnote is the restoration of the royal line. It is found in chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. So literally, uh, the fifth vision takes up all of chapter 4 according to this version of the eight visions of Zechariah. Now notice what's in common in the vision of uh, the fourth and the fifth vision. One deals with Joshua, the restoration of the priestly line. And then one deals with Zerubbabel, the restoration of the royal line line. The sixth vision in this version of eight is labeled a flying scroll, a flying scroll. And the footnote is, is it about the removal of sin from among Israel. This is the, uh, this is this vision. The sixth vision is the one that we said, God willing, we'll get to when we get to chapter five. So chapter uh chapter 4 through 14 we'll be finishing up the vision of zerubbabel which deals with the restoration of the royal line the seventh of eight in this version of eight is labeled woman in a basket woman in a basket its footnote is the removal of sin from the nations this can be found in uh, Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. And then the final uh, vision in this version of 8 is four chariots. Four chariots. And the footnote is simply, peace among the nations of the earth. This will get us through chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Those are the eight visions according to to this first version of the visions that Zechariah saw. Now, in the second version of the eight, and I'll read these because they're more lengthy than these short words of myrtle trees, four horns, measuring stick, Joshua, Zerubbabel, flying scroll, woman in a basket, and four cherries. Those are just 
quick one-liners. But in this version of the eight, we have these particular presentations. They call the first version a vision of horses. And this is seen in chapter one, verses seven through 17. And in this second version, it says, this vision um, teaches us about the merciful way the Lord would deal with Jerusalem. The merciful way God would deal with Jerusalem. The second vision is a vision of four horns and four carpenters, Zechariah chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, which is about the powers uh, horns that scatter Judah and will happen and what will happen rather to these nations. So the second, vi the second vision is about the nations that will scatter God's people and what judgment will come upon those nations who God used to scatter them. Boy, that's a mouthful. God uses somebody to scatter somebody, then God judges those who he used to scatter his people. I think, remember when we talked about this, and not just in Zechariah, but also in other discussions of the minor prophets, we said that it was never about Assyria or Syria. It was never about uh, Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon. It was always about Israel and Judah, northern and southern kingdoms, the people as a whole. It was always about God's people not being right. God, that God would use what they call the heathen or the ungodly as a chastisement, as a, as a whipping stick, as a yoke, as a chastiser to his people to get them right. Not that Assyria and Syria was strong, not that Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was macking out and they had all this power and they couldn't do anything but yield to them. No, 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 no. God used them. And so it is even in the contemporary mindset, I believe uh, nations like America, nations like Russia, nations like um, England or the United Kingdom and other world powers, Germany, we could go on and on. China, once we start thinking that we are the boss or the bully of the world and that our economies and that our systems of government, that our societal values, our core beliefs are the best in the world, whether it be uh, those who are in a republic or in a democracy, those who may be in a socialist society, whenever you start thinking who you are is the best and then everybody else in the world just ought to be like you, we start getting Babylon and Syria, ancient Babylon and Syria, Assyria mindsets that we're just it. But we got to be careful because God can do to us today what he did to them yesterday. Hmm. The third vision in the second version of, version of the eight visions is about the vision of a man with a measuring line. This is Zechariah chapter two. And this third version, in this particular version of the visions, uh, it, it, it testifies of the Lord's protective power over his people. God's protective power over his people. Now, y'all know we're already about 19 minutes in. I'm only going to talk about 25 or 30 minutes a night. But just reviewing the meaning of the various visions that Zechariah saw are so relevant to where we are today. Because God still has the proclivity to protect his people, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's say it like this. God still watches over me. <laughs> Come on, come on, just just lift your hands with me. Just just pack yourself and say, Pastor Manaway, I agree with you, sir. I am so privileged to have the Lord of heaven watching over me, protecting me. Yes, he is. Over the powers that would crush me. The fifth vision in the second version of the eight is a vision of the high priest Zechariah or Zerubbabel, which symbolizes how Judah can overcome Satan and be cleansed through the person of Jesus Christ. Th that's where we get the branch, that, that, that statement of the branch in Zechariah chapter three, Jesus Christ, the branch of God. 
once again symbolizing how Judah can overcome Satan and be cleansed through the person and power of Jesus Christ. And then here in the one, two, three, four, five, six, the sixth vision, here is, uh, I'm sorry, the fifth vision, one, two, three, four, five, excuse me. I did flunk that, but that, I won't go there. Tabernacle, you've heard that story so many times. So in the fifth vision, it is a vision of the lampstands and olive trees, all of Zechariah chapter four. And this vision symbolizes how the Lord will give power to his people by the person of the Holy Spirit. He still gives us power. I, I, I remember every time I talk about God giving us power, the, the first text that comes to my mind each time automatically is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where God tells those uh, post-resurrection believers, you know, go wait in Jerusalem because I'm going to send something to you that I promised that I was going to send to you. And uh, he said, wait, because the Holy Ghost is on his way. You shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then, I need to preach that this year, don't I? All over again. Then you can be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and until the utmost parts of the earth. <laughs> wow. So even then, God did not just give them the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit to feel spiritually superior to another individual or a group of people. He was always, he always gave his power, lent his anointing for us to have the ability to give him glory in what we did in the earth, i.e. doing his will. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 5, 13 and 14. So then remember that you are the salt of the earth. You know, don't lose your saltiness. You are the light of the world. Don't get your, don't get your flame lit and then put it under a basket and hold it. You know, you're the light of the world. You know, let, let every man see your good works and glorify. There it is. Glorify the Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine. And so this vision of the lampstands and the olive trees symbolize how God gives power to his people through the Holy Spirit. And then number seven in this second version of eight is the vision of a flying scroll. Chapter five, verses one through four, which taught that those who were dishonest in the land were condemned. Those who were dishonest in the land were condemned. Isn't that something? And then here, number seven, there is a vision of a woman in a basket. Now, this one is going to be interesting to me because in all of my studying so far, I still haven't, I don't feel like I have a good grip on this one yet. Woman in a basket. But it's going to testify that wickedness could be removed from God's people. Wickedness can be removed from God's people. So if that be the case, and the thesis would be then in a question, how does God remove wickedness from among his people? <laughs> Can you feel that tension? Woo! Boy, that seventh vision is going to be something else, isn't it? Chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. And then finally, the eighth vision in the second version of the eight deals with the vision of four chariots. The vision of four chariots, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And this particular vision, the last vision, the eighth vision, symbolizes the spreading of the Lord's power over the whole earth. And we could just say tonight, amen, because God's power is still being filled throughout the whole earth in all of the world. So if you're just getting with us, that's just a quick review as we get started here in 2022 about what the eight visions of this particular prophet Zechariah are about, what those visions symbolize. So we've been dealing here, we started in chapter four, so we're dealing with the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth vision of the eight, which covers all of chapter four, and we're talking about Something that symbolizes how God will give power to his people through the Holy Spirit. Wow, isn't that good preaching? How God will give power to his people through the Holy Spirit. 
We are in particular verse uh, 7. And so I'm going to write myself a note because when we talk to you again, we can talk about living in the power of the Holy Spirit and how God gives that. I think that's something that's a theme that we need to not run away from. If we're going to be God's people and be spirit led, led by the spirit, we need to, excuse me, put some time in on understanding what that's about. Okay, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7, for about the next four or five minutes. Let's see if we can get this introduced. So, who are you? That's, that's a question of Zechariah 4, verse 7. Who are you? Speaking of God's people and even speaking of us, he says, Oh, great mountain, question mark. Before Zerubbabel, he says, you shall become a plain. The work of rebuilding the temple was so massive. That's what's been going on that it seemed like a great mountain. The work of completing the temple felt like, seemed like it was this great mountain that needed to be addressed. Now, God help me not to get stuck here. Contextualizing. Remember verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. That verse is specific to God giving his people, Israel, Judah, the strength to rebuild the temple. That's the specific context of God saying, Zerubbabel, you would not, you and the people would not be able to get this specific task done by your own power, by your own might, but it will be by my spirit. And this monumental task of rebuilding the temple seemed as if it were like a mountain. In verse 7, God is saying, though it seems to be like a mountain, help me, Holy Spirit, help me, Holy Spirit. Though it seems like a mountain that's so big, God says to them, but look, I'm going to make it seem like it's a plain. Isn't that beautiful? Has God ever took something in your life and that seemed to be insurmountable, unconquerable, and made it come down, he brought it down. The prophet Isaiah, if I can really say this in the right context, he talk about how this, he talks about how this God we serve, he's able to bring highways low. He's able to make crooked ways straight. He's able to make rough ways smooth. Huh? This God that we serve, he's able to put rivers in desert places. So it's no wonder, he says to Zerubbabel, this leader of the spiritual part of rebuilding the temple, look, man, I know it seems like it's a big job, a big assignment, a big calling. But if you depend on my spirit and not depend on your might and your power, I will make it like a plane. <laughs> Here God promised that by his spirit, the great mountain would be leveled into a plain. That's what he's saying in verse 7. First of all, in this case, the great mountain may have literally been the mountains of the piles of rubble and all the debris. For instance, when Nehemiah came back and he was doing the survey of now, how the walls had been destroyed. The walls and the gates of Jerusalem had been destroyed. Y'all remember that? And uh, he said that he could hardly get his survey work done because of all of the rubbish, the garbage, the pile, all of the trash that uh, had not been dealt with. Okay, boy, how do we keep walking into this stuff, Tabernacle? What are you talking about? I'm trying to tell you this, these little simple spiritual principles. Zechariah says in his writing of Zerubbabel, he says the mountains could imply the mountains of rubble at the temple. The rubbish could be removed and the work could carry on. Uh, uh, Nehemiah said, I couldn't get my survey work done to see how extensive the work was until I got the rubbish, got the garbage cleaned up. May I suggest, as I get ready to conclude for the night, because I don't want to deal, I don't want to dive into anything else before we get this particular part clear. But look, Tabernacle and friends, 
why don't we just, first of all, in 2022, clean up the trash? Why don't we just deal with some rubbish? Why don't we just deal with some garbage so we can know, so we can see what we need to walk? Understand how we need to talk. Understand how we need to behave. Worship, serve, give to the kingdom of God. Work can be hindered on a physical level by it being so much rubbish and trash and debris and work can only be effective. And first of all, we have the need to clean up. My mama blessed Josephine's heart. If there's anything she despised, and my wife Jessica, they despise a dirty kitchen. Hmm. They never would try to cook a meal, a new meal, a fresh meal, until they made sure everything that was left over from the previous meal was clean and put in its place. That's enough for the night. Look, I'll see you next week, God willing. For now, continue to do uh, the personal studies on your research questions or your study questions. Lord, help me. <laughs> Remember, drop us a line at pastor underscore manaway at yahoo.com or pastor manaway, under, pastor manaway, pastor underscore manaway at gmail.com. And we'll try to get those uh, uh, answers to you. Let's pray. Eternal God, thank you for the night and help us as we proceed now to going about this year in 2022. Tonight, may this prevailing lesson or precept that we gain from verse 7 be made clear in our lives as we begin this year. Show us the rubbish, show us the garbage, show us the trash, show us the refuge of our lives that we need to clean, remove before we proceed in trying to rebuild, refresh, remodel those things that are needful for your glory. We ask for rest and sleep tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night, shalom, and good day. Until next time.